All right. Um, so here we are for our third uh, session today. Uh, and just like the others, uh, we've already sort of uh, touched upon a number of, uh, I think, these themes a little bit. And so really now is our chance to explore it. And that's sort of um, what broadly I might describe as the moral distress of tax professionals. Um, and in this context, we're understanding moral distress uh, to refer to the psychological and emotional state that arises when uh, individuals face situations where their personal values, their ethical principles, and their moral beliefs are challenged and or compromised. Um, and so we can see this happen when individuals are aware or have some sense of what they might describe as a morally right course of action, um, but they face constraints that um, prevent them or move them away from acting in accordance with that. Uh, and that is really the source of the conflict. Um, and this can occur in many, many situations, but including professional environments. And that's really what uh, we're focused on today. Um, so I thought I would start with kind of a grounding question um, and, and basically ask, um, as we look at tax professionals operating in the gray area, um, what are the most relevant concerns and ethical dilemmas that you see them facing? So I'll just kind of start with that. John? Uh, well, I think a lot of what we've already discussed today in, is encompassed in that question. Um, I've been listening um, very carefully to um, uh, the insights of, of those who have contributed so far in the um, in the program. And what I've heard, um, just to kind of reiterate back, um, and I'd be interested to see if I've missed anything, um, is really some... Um, ambiguity and some complexity that kind of falls in general broad areas. I, I think interpretation of the tax laws, uh, that's something heard, you know, the question between avoidance and evasion, uh, that's another, the use of tax havens, um, and then this whole process of how aggressive should one be in, um, in tax planning, you know, how far do you get to the line and what do you do in the space in between the lines? Um, and then I kept hearing again and again this question of disclosure of client information. And so these were the thematic areas that I heard again and again in the conversation today um, that encompass what you know I would say as an ethicist falls in this uh, this gray zone or this gray area. Thank you. Anyone else have any initial thoughts on that that I might want to? Philippa. Thanks, Diane. Um, not being a tax practitioner, but more someone who's interested in antidotes to um, moral distress or not functional antidotes to moral distress. Um, I just thought it was important to just talk a little bit about the history and, and very, very briefly that this is there's actually no literature in law about moral distress that this is actually something that is written about a lot in nursing more and social work second. And it was founded by a, a bioethicist named, or the term was coined by a bioethicist named Andrew Jamiton in 1984 to describe the emotional experience of nurses, especially and then other medical professionals who came into contact or came up against their own moral codes or their own moral values and then were blocked from behaving or acting in a professional way because of institutional constraints. So moral distress has this very narrow view of being instit of institutional restraints. And those restraints could be, for instance, a patient is dying, um, keep, whether to keep the patient on long-term um, life support, but the family doesn't want it, or the hospital has particular rules. It's this kind of thing. So it's really interesting to think of in the tax con um, context, because what would be the institutional constraints? Actually, that's perfect, because I was actually going to bring us to a question that kind of took 
uh, Don's identification of thematic areas uh, of tax professionals uh, working in the gray space and kind of bring it into the place of work, right? You work in an accounting firm, you may work in a tax firm, you may also work in house, but often uh, in law and accounting firms. And sort of what about, what is it about being in that structural space of work um, that helps shape uh, and contribute to the particular uh, dimensions of dilemma and ultimately moral distress um, that tax advisors may face? I think you pose a very interesting observation because when you think of it in the nursing context, I've I've read some of that literature. Um, they're really life and death situations, whereas here we're not necessarily talking um, in most cases about physical life and death. It's almost like life and death of a career um, or of um, you know economic stability or you know other measures so the question i would have um and maybe it's you know best responded to by psychologists um or other mental health professionals it's like what how much of that can you absorb that stress can you absorb before it impacts your ability to make sound um decisions <laughs> I think that that is an incredible question because also if you've done some of the reading later on, Hamilton came up with an idea of moral residue, which this is sort of the baggage that people carry with them because of unresolved moral distress, because there are not a lot of functional ways to dissolve moral distress, or you may come up against a lot of it, especially during COVID, there was a lot of moral distress with whom to give a ventilator to and other questions. So you're so right, Don, because there are issues about this moral uh, residue infecting or coloring or biasing the way you see the world. And what happens is that, at least in the nursing context, people go into stress or even trauma or even physical uh, difficulties. So I don't know if there are any issues that tax professionals have encountered that would rise to this level, but there's also ethical dilemmas, which means there's one choice and another, and the dilemma is which choice to uh, choose. Uh, Susan and then Mary. Sure. Well, I think Don's and Philippa's observations are helpful and help in, I think, leading me to think about people in the trenches and how they're pulled in different directions. And as suggested, you have these issues associated with one's own moral code that may put pressure on you to act in one way and maybe clients and others are pushing you in a different direction. The others may be the people with whom you work. And part of what I suggested to Diane that I've seen over the last couple of decades is the way that changing compensation systems and organizations have basically contributed to more moral distress from the standpoint of lawyers whose own moral compass may direct them uh, one way, uh, maybe telling the client no, but there's also then the bottom line when you have a compensation system that's largely based on generation of business and collectibles and some collections. And so what are you going to do in those situations? But I'm going to be a little provocative here. I think that maybe we're looking at moral distress as a bad thing. And I'd like the group to, to reflect on whether it's a good thing that people actually are agonizing over these decisions. What I'd worry about is somebody that might be characterized as morally agnostic and doesn't even see the problems and they go on their merry way. Thank you. Uh, Mary and then Don. Yeah, I'm. I, I come at this and I, I really like that is a it is a thought provoking question, um, Susan. I, I come at this from thinking um, about how whistleblowers respond uh, and make the decision to actually speak up. Um, and so this idea of moral distress and moral residue is really interesting to me because there's a lot of cognitive dissonance that happens. Um, we hear all the stories about whistleblowers are actually speak up, but a lot of whistleblowers um, 
the psychosocial impacts of whistleblowing are so strong that it often sometimes silences people. So we're talking about what kind of atmospheric discoloration or um, interference happens. And so what I can say is that we've seen this, I've known this for years representing whistleblowers, but we saw it in full um, display in the Me Too movement is this issue of gaslighting. And it was interesting that Susan talked about your peers and things, because if you are in an organization, say um, you're at working at like a wire card or a scenario where um, in Germany where whistleblowers were very uh, strongly retaliated against, anyone else who now sees the subsequent problem is going to be chilled, right? Because they saw the way the hammer came down on that particular whistleblower. Um, and you realize that you're going to lose your social network. And for a lot of us where our careers are everything, you lose um, a lot of that of your of your support system, both your work and your social support system, and you begin to doubt yourself. So I just would point folks to there's some interesting research coming out of um, New England Journal of Medicine about off uh, whistleblowers in the off-label pharmaceutical, in the pharmaceutical industry pointing to off-label uses of particular drugs. Um, and they were basically showing higher incidences of divorce, of um, depression, of, um, anxiety, uh, 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 substance abuse, just a whole parade of horribles. So I'm not exactly sure how that intersects with moral distress and moral injury, but I can tell you that um, they're all a little bit of a piece when someone's trying to make that decision to speak up. A lot of this stuff both can be good in helping you, to Susan's point, to decide to speak up, but it also can have the opposite effect of chilling you from speaking up. Thank you, uh, Don, and then Philippa. I was I, I find again all of this very fascinating, um, Susan. Though I wanted to go back to something you were talking about a minute ago about um, the person who's lukewarm or um, um, non-committal uh, or um, uh, not wanting to engage. I was. Um, interested in this idea of moral distress. And I wanted to uh, get a better understanding of what happens um, uh, when you're in this stressful situation. Does it make um, a person become more dishonest or does it make someone become more honest? Um, and what does, that, um, what does that do? And I came across a very interesting study. It's being peer reviewed now. So it's in pre- um, it's in pre-review, so I, I don't know how it's going to come out, but I thought the um, the question was really interesting. It was opposed by, uh, they're actually dual researchers, inter, I guess, cross-disciplinary. Um, one was in neuroscience and one was in business. Um, and um, they were looking at when a, um, a person is in a, a morally distressed um, situation in a, uh, a business environment. Um, and, um, does again, it goes back to this question, does it make a person's behavior, that stressful situation, make them more dishonest or more honest? And what they came up with, they constructed this whole study on how to test it. But basically it came down to this question of what is the individual person's moral default? Like who is it that they are in their person? And when they're put in this stressful situation, um, the person whose uh, moral default is more um, on the dishonest side of things, it made them um, uh, behave in a more dishonest way. But interestingly, the, um, the people who are in the honest situation, they become so stressed about the um, uh, ability to be seen as dishonest that they become almost, I don't know if this can be a thing, overly honest. Um, and um, I thought that was very interesting, but they did not test anyone that they couldn't find a way to assess someone who's like morally ambivalent. So um, I don't I don't know how that works out, but I, I found that to be um, pretty, excuse me, pretty interesting. Thank you, uh, Philippa. Thank you, Susan uh, struck a chord with me, a quote that I just wrote down, Susan, it was just a throwaway quote. <clears throat> from an article in 2016 in the um, American Journal of Nursing, it says, despite its many negative effects, moral distress can precipitate positive growth producing experiences, establishing an alternative story in air quotes about a morally distressing situation 
can help clinicians to shift their perspective to that of the of a victim of one to that of a victim to one of empowered agency. So it's sort of in that idea of Susan Dweck's growth philosophy that from being in a mistake or being in in needing something going wrong that you actually grow more from it. Thank you. Thank you on that one. Um, you know, it, it's interesting to, as actually, I think I'm trying to think who it was who raised this, but I, I was going to sort of go in the direction of thinking to the extent, and, and I think Susan, you just laid that out nicely, questions are too bad, you know, to the extent there is a, a period, a space, both in time and sort of geographic space of where you're working of moral distress. Um, it's that it's that potential conflict or clash, and then where does it push you, and what does it push you to do? Um, you're right. It could it it could be one that sort of uh, encourages you to think more carefully about what you're doing. And if you're in leadership roles, it might lead you to encourage a for, the firm to have clearer guidelines. It might lead you to be active in the bar association. Um, but I, I, I question, I, but if I were to sort of think the preponderance of cases, I, I, it's sort of interesting to think how much is that and how much is it, I don't want to lose my job. I can only say or do so much. So do I, do I keep acknowledging that I'm uncomfortable with what I'm doing and try to contain the bad behavior a bit, which means I'm always acknowledging every day, I don't think, I don't feel good about it. Or do I really want to reframe it? I mean, does it really push me to get comfortable with the things I do every day? I get I engage in a certain set of kinds of conducts every day. And do I push myself to find a way to get comfortable rather than either go all the way out and fix them or minimize them? Um, and I just was sort of thinking a bit about that. Um, Mary and then Meredith. Thanks. I really um I can give hopefully with some anecdotal experience here that might be helpful. So I have the great privilege of representing Tyler Schultz, who's uh, one of the Theranos whistleblowers who exposed Elizabeth Holmes and also Francis Haugen, the Facebook whistleblower. And what I can tell you, which is really to Philippa's point, is that in those examples, we actually do see empowerment, that the act of speaking up has led them, you know, to become people who have um, you know, sort of walked through fire. They always say diamonds are forged um, through pressure. <laughs> and that pressure um, has had them really become change agents more globally. Um, so, you know, Tyler and his co-whistleblower, Erica Chung, created a, a nonprofit called Ethics and Entrepreneurship. They're trying to help people um, give advice and start corporate governance um, in um, startups from inception, not waiting till you're barreling down the pike. So, you know, they their voices became strong enough that they want to change industry. Similarly with Frances Haugen, she's a big spokesperson, has a nonprofit called Beyond the Screen um, that is trying to, to not replicate in AI um, what some of the problems that we saw with social, uh, the failure to regulate social media companies. So I just wanted to share those anecdotes, but I also wanted to say, um, and in turn, those whistleblowers who become empowered become magnets for future whistleblowers. So I can tell you there are so many additional clients I have now who've come to me and said, I was inspired by Tyler and Francis. Um, I'm coming to you now because of that. So I do think it's really important to sort of think about the knock-on effects of when they do become empowered. So I think we hear too often um, all the stories about, you know, the, the bad things that happen to whistleblowers. Um, but it is nice to see that the opposite um, can happen as well. Thank you. Uh, Meredith and then Don. Uh, thank you so much, Mary, for doing that work, um, for uh, supporting the whistleblowers in that way. Um, I My background is in theology and pastoral care and sort of ethical considerations as they relate to, you know, spiritual practice or religion, religious tradition. And um, uh, we use lots of different languages to, to talk about what our sort of inner moral compass, our inner conscience you know, the inner voice that tells us what the right thing is to do. But then so often the external world uh, puts, you know, challenges in our way or even laws that don't reflect those uh, those same ethical considerations. And so there's a real tension uh, between our own inner voice of what, you know, our voice of reason and then 
um, you know, the, the, the external conditions. And how we negotiate that is the opportunity for, for personal growth and, and personal coming into our full awareness. Those are words I've heard Philippa use a few times now. And that's an uncomfortable place to be, obviously, but um, how we negotiate that. And um, I also want to link this with the language around calling them gray areas, that these are, that, that um, you know, the, the, the uh, improprieties and different things and scenarios are lead us into sort of like gray areas. But the truth is, is that almost all, um, you know, almost all professions have moments of gray grayness where we have to negotiate, like, what is the ethical, what is the right path that I should take? And um, religious scripture and um, different writings have tried to answer these questions or give us you know, um, give us some uh, clues on that. And one I would just like to point to is um, the Hindu scripture of the Bhagavad Gita. It's actually set in the midst of a war. The main protagonist um, in that story, Arjuna, he's um, <clears throat> he's sort of on the side of the good. He has to fight against, decide whether or not he's going to fight against evil, which are also his relatives. But the entire dialogue between um, the main character, Arjuna, and, and uh, Lord Krishna, it happens in the midst of a war. And this is really symbolic of not just uh, um, <clears throat> these happen on a micro level every day, but also the massive major decisions that we have to make. Like, will I go to war? Will I stand up against this? And so um, and then that is played out um, in that um, in that uh, holy holy book. But um so I think the the issue of the gray area happens on a large scale, small scale. But what's important also in that book is that there is a dialogue and you have external supports and inputs and to so that people who are facing these these considerations and especially one as important as whistleblowing, that they have someone who they can speak to, a counselor, a, gu a guide, that they have um, people who can um, advise them. And that is uh, one of the things in the book that um, that is, is emphasized is that that you really you, it's difficult to navigate these very difficult, these uh, challenging, you know, these gray areas alone you know, doing that alone is very challenging. So you often need um, support systems, inputs. And so those are other things we've heard about is how can we support people who are making these decisions? How can they be supported throughout the process? Um, I said a lot there because I've been kind of adding them up, but um, but the uh, but I think the idea about the internal external tensions and the gray areas is something that we all live with. That's the, that's the human condition and um, how we navigate it is. Um, Part of that's the story of of why we why we have religious books, religious guidance, and things like that. Spiritual, uh, spiritual, spiritual inputs. Thank you, Marion. Uh, Don. I've almost forgot the original query question, but I just wanted to make a few comments in response to Mary and also Meredith. Um, in part of what I do is I'm a podcast host and I tell narrative stories about the social and moral value of business. And I think it's very important um, to acknowledge the, um, the strength and value of narrative storytelling. Um, Mary, just being able to tell the story of Theranos um, uh, and how you frame that, um, uh, again, has the opportunity to either um, inspire or totally um, uh, um, you know, uh, divorce or, or, or scare away others. And so the way we tell our stories um, impacts or creates a, a sense of um, the direction of impact that we can have, and they're powerful. Um, you know, Meredith, you were just talking about uh, you know stories that were centuries old. Um, you know, why are we still telling those stories? Um, and so, I think as professionals, we have a fabulous opportunity to um, frame narratives, either the ones that we tell to each other as professionals, or the ones that we tell to an outside, bright, broader world. Uh, thank you, Don. And I and that's um, actually you did kind of tap in. So you know, one of the things thinking about is uh, how are how are tax professionals who aren't making the decision to sort of fix go out, whether it's whistleblowing, whether it's direct, you know, internally fix the dimension of culture conflict that you're experiencing, things you're asked to do that you don't feel comfortable with. They're not fixing it. What else are they doing? Are they telling for that not small group? 
that is not really fixing, isn't really whistleblowing or doing any of those um, steps, um, are they telling themselves a story that allows them to ignore it? You know, what what is that space looking like? Um, and so I do think, yeah, the narrative works in, in both directions and is really, uh, you know, quite a quite an interesting question. Uh, Felipe, you had your hand up. Yeah, I was just going to say that the self-awareness, um, I loved what Meredith was talking about, about using spirituality. And in addition, uh, whether a person is spiritual or not, as people may have noticed, I'm, I'm a proponent of mindfulness and self-awareness. And I think it's really important whether you go all the way and become a natural meditator yourself or not is not the important part. The important part is knowing and being reflective and being critical about what your intentionality is and to have support in doing that. For instance, in uh, many small uh, groups, uh, we'll say even in hospitals, I know they have groups where people get together and will talk or about what's going on and these groups are committed to confidentiality, just like lawyers concerned for lawyers. There are small groups where people are committed to confidentiality and talking over a program because very often you have the strength within yourself, but you need that sort of a support of a group to pull it out. And that could be a writing workshop where you write together and don't even share it, but just sit together and write or perhaps share and uh, other groups where people could just speak with one another to get some guidance that is not a supervisor, not somebody who's going to fire them. And I think these are very, very important tools we could give young tax practitioners. Thank you, Philippa. Uh, Susan. Sure, and I appreciate Philippa using that term self-awareness because it has me thinking about the lawyer who's in the trenches and a tax practice or other transactional practice and how they uh, move forward when let's say you have a client that really is pushing the envelope and you're not comfortable with it. And so really what is your role? It's so often those of us that teach in law school know that the default becomes, you know, I will not cross the line. Uh, but um, among lawyers, you'll see, I think, the range of is it your duty something to pay as close to the line as possible without going over the line? And that, I think, is informed by your self-awareness, your self-image. I think it's also informed by the client's expectations of you and whether they see you as that technician, that hired gun who is supposed to basically achieve what they want as long as it's not over the line. And what does that mean for the lawyer who is concerned in terms of his or her own moral compass? And so one of the, the old legal ethics uh, professors now passed away from Notre Dame, um, put forth the model of the lawyer as friend. So not hired gun, not guru. It's this idea that instead of trying to impose your views on the client when it comes to something that may be morally questionable, that you act like a friend. What do you do with your friends? I think some people have comfort level with their friends where you at least challenge them, that you raise these questions. And do we do our clients a disservice by just becoming the technician, the hired gun, and put the blinders on and listen to that narrative, to use the expression that, that others have used, um, where we just aren't willing to challenge our clients. So I'm not sure from the standpoint of those who those of you who teach in law schools or in graduate schools, if you um, have, have rec basically um, recognized this tendency of students assuming the lawyer's duty is to do whatever is necessary as long as it's not, uh, doesn't go over the line. Yes, yeah, Susan, that is, that is really fantastic. It kind of leads to sort of the last little bit of space I was hoping we could touch on, you know, um, a couple dimensions of your, your sort of question there. Uh, there really does, and I think it's informed a little bit by the dominant, particularly in law school, but even in society, the dominant image of lawyer as defense attorney, like criminal defense attorney, and the duties and the 
uh, expectations that role carries with it and whether or not that defines the lawyer's relationship, the tax advisor's relationship in all other dynamics. Um, and so, uh, you know, that is certainly, I think, shaping students' expectations. But I will say, having had an entire panel discussion at a, at a tax, uh, large scale tax meeting on the question really of what is the lawyer's, the tax lawyer's role in advising? Is it to bring you to the bright line, find the bright, bright line and bring you right to it? Um, is the tax lawyer able to step back from that absolute line of criminality um, and say, I'm not comfortable going that close and I'm not gonna work with you in that space and you shouldn't? Uh, is that actually wrong? You're actually wrong for doing that. Um, uh, and what do we think of tax advisors who use other strategies to get to that backing off, such as uh, this is not really the right thing to do because if you get caught, don't it's not so much the tax consequences, but it's the major press, New York Times, Wall Street Journal, that's what you don't want. Um, and trying to use other strategies. Now, maybe that's friendship. I'm not sure. I think it's 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 a mix of, of kinds of leverage points, but a really um, continuing conversation for which I see no resolution in the um, the tax context. Um, uh, yeah. Danielle, I, I was, Danielle, I was about to come to you next and see if you had a little bit you might yeah. want to add to close us out here. Uh, the point is... Mm. It's not a question to be a tax advisor. It depends on your on your own culture. You know, there is a, a book in Italy. Uh, have you ever heard about Leonardo Sciascia? He was a Sicilian writer. In, he wrote a book called Il Giorno della Civetta. Uh, and the book talks about the uh, mafia environment if I may say, a kind of ma mafia culture, culture in the mean of their own values. And at a certain point, the writer says that there are three kinds of men. I will say in Sicilian and then we translate. Uomini, mezzi uomini, ominichi e qualacuacua. So men's, half men's, little men's, and qualacuacua. So something that doesn't. And the point is, I came from this Sicilian family and the values of my family are to be, be at least in the middle between the men's and the half men's. All this to say what? Of course, it happened to me that some client know exactly what I want me to say or to write, mostly with crypto. I remember at the beginning years ago when I meet uh, a prospect, not, not, not a proper client, I meet a prospect and he said to me, I want put, I want fill, uh, I want put the crypto on, on my tax declaration. I said, it's your choice, but the law says that you have got to do that. And he answered me, oh, it's easier. It's easy to do your job like this. And I said to him, this is the only way I know. The point is, so it's not the point to be a tax advisor. The point is, which are your values? Where do you came from? The point is, if you do this work because you are amazed by the money, by the um, income, maybe it's easier that you will uh, suggest the wrong solution. And then you find the way to defend yourself. If you love, if you do this job, this work, because you love what you are doing, you you work, because I it's now quite 13 years that I work, but the point is, I work because I love to do what I'm doing. But as you can see, and I go back, this, not the, this depends on your value, on your culture. So it's not just a, a rule of law, it's a kind of rule of life. I just want to ask one follow-up to your, your, your remarks there. Did you feel you were supported in your decisions here? or I was supported uh, by myself. And yeah. I, was, uh, I was okay with by, my, by myself. Understood. All right. Well, on that, on that uh, really kind of ties it all together. Um, I want to thank you all. Um, it's been a, just a wonderful conversation, obviously, throughout all three panels and uh, really closing this one out to sort of think about and focus on the tax advisors themselves uh, as professionals in this space and the challenges there. So uh, a wonderful morning, afternoon and evening with all of you. And at this point, I'm going to turn it back over to Costa. 
Thank you, Diane. And I would just like to add uh, that I would like to thank uh, Professor Diane Ring for her outstanding moderation, our excellent panelists for the valuable insights, and all the audience uh, members who stayed with us until the very end. Uh, your presence and active participation have significantly enhanced our discussion. Thank you so much.